If they are getting what we promised them in the Christian life, giving flows from it. That's right. Charlene, who for the first, the one, sorry. <laughs> giving, <laughs> always did the talk on giving for the first year that I was here in this church. And my goodness, she was affected. I don't know what she did, whether she threatened to blow people's kneecaps off, or what? <laughs> Derringer and Allen bag, but either way, my goodness, people gave. And because they gave, within a year, I was able to go to from scraping by on $1,200 a month to nearly a full pastor's salary, according to MCC rules, in just a year. When, as I've said to you again and again and again, everybody, and I'm not naming names, but everybody told me that I was insane to go anywhere near New Orleans because it was a kiss of death when it came to churches. This is what I was told. Well, it was the generosity, first and foremost, actually, of the people uh, those were coming to the church that showed in hard black and white, on paper, month after month after month, to everybody who had doubted the wisdom, that there was passion for God in this city. And that there is passion for God amongst the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community in this city. And again, we stand, or at least we sit at the moment, most of us, as proof positive to anybody who would doubt God's loving presence in diverse communities. No matter how God made you, whether you be straight, whether you be gay, whether you be black, whether you be white, whether you be anything under the sun inherently put there by God, anybody who doubts God's loving presence upon these people only has to walk into this church. We are living proof. We are a living rebuke to all those who doubt God's fullness of love for our community. Amen. Amen. Our accounts are a living rebuke for those who doubt God's fullness of love for this community. For all those who belittle the LGBT community as being completely shallow and obsessed with only one thing, our accounts, our presence in this building, our numbers, everything about us, our outreach, our passion, our prayer, and our spirituality stand as a direct contradiction to that stereotype. Amen. We are our own best argument. We are our own best argument just as we are. Hallelujah. And we won't stay as we are for more than a few seconds because growth and change and development are the Christian life. Anybody who is satisfied with where they are at the moment probably has a lot of work to do. Uh -huh. I lose myself because I frequently get to that point. Whenever we get to the point of settling or resting, because we appreciate that we have made progress, that we've, we've jumped a hurdle, that we've been delivered of something that beset us for many years, then the danger comes about. This is why I've gone back again and again to extraordinary figures from the past who speak to us in the present. People like the Desert Fathers, who you've had weeks of. Well, I have some good news for you. There are going to be no desert father quotes in today's summer. <laughs> 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 However, there are some quotes. There are some quotes. <laughs> it goes to the heart of what is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament approach to finances and stewardship and giving and all those difficult things which people struggle over. And I was the worst of all. I mean, the idea that clergy would give to the church was, for the first three years of my ordination, so bizarre and alien that I thought somebody was having a joke with me when they suggested that I start dying. Seriously, I'm not joking with you. I saw somebody, you know, when we were in uh, MCCLA and I had a conversation with uh, one of the clergy about tithing, and they mentioned, you know, that tithing rate whatever, they didn't tell me what it was. I went home and I had to speak to them about it. I was astonished. If they're being paid by this church, why are they giving back to it? Because they want to, was the answer I received. Yeah. Because they want to. Strange things people do. Well, once I started doing the same myself, I saw the value of what Charlene used to say about you don't give them to it. It hurts, you give them to it, it feels good. That's right. But, That's right. but, yeah, so. but, Herein lies the danger. 
Herein lies the yawning chasm in all teaching about stewardship and all teaching about giving. Here is the pitfall. And the pitfall is, we know God gives us good things. We know that God gives us extraordinary blessings. And the measure of those blessings is just directly attached to how heavily we draw upon them. But if you're not careful, it makes it sound like we are bribing people. That, oh, come on, give us some money and you'll get more money back. <laughs> I've heard sermons which sound dangerously close to a direct quid pro quo. You know, you give us some money and we'll make sure you get more back because it's a magic spell, you see. God will always give you uh, more money because God wants to see you rich. God doesn't want to see you developed and whole and holy and healthy and all these different things. No, primarily that works itself out with having a Jaguar and a large house. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> these things are not opposed to the Christian life, but they are not a direct consequence of the Christian life. The willingness to give up all, which thankfully is seldom called upon, is the way we find peace in all our financial dealings. Right. Once we get to that point whereby we realize that <coughs> God will sustain us, not just spiritually, not just emotionally, but right. physically as well, that no matter what happens to us physically, we have, I'm going to use a, a phrase, we have victory in Jesus. Yes, we do. And I don't care how you interpret that, there are lots of different ways of saying the same thing. And most religious traditions are saying the same thing with different language, and we fail to understand them. We think that they are preaching terrible heresy, when really they're just sick. Different Christian denominations shout at each other for saying identical things with different words in different language. When I started at the Church of England, I desperately, desperately wished that the enthusiasm and the joy which I experienced in a charismatic church as a teenager could be married somehow to the beauty of the worship which I found in the Anglo-Catholic tradition. Sometimes I would sit in a mass and I knew that I had that, that, I, that adoration with God and I was doing all I wanted to do, but the priest seemed to be almost bored and ashamed of what he was saying up there on the pulpit. And I was appalled. And it was because many of the clergy I was speaking to had been so heavily wounded that anything which smelt of the evangelical movement, anything which smelt of the charismatic movement, anything which sounded like Pentecostalism, they were so terrified of that they would do the opposite. Even if it meant that everyone sat bored to tears and depressed in the church with a priest sounding like he couldn't bear to hear the words that were coming out of his mouth. That's a terrible misunderstanding. There's nothing, there's no reason why we can't marry the different traditions. There's no reason why we can't marry them all under the overarching principle of a passion for God. Because without that passion for God, which will manifest itself in so many different ways, not everybody is going to be bursting and beaming with energy through that passion. There is an interior passion. There is a still small voice. There is that light that shines in the darkness when somebody is quiet, kneeling in prayer. And it's just as authentic. And it's just as passionate. And it's just as glorious. And it is the same thing that has people dancing in the unhealthy. That's right. Come on. We just need to have to be able to see that in other people. Hear it from other people and honor it in other people. 